Hi, Rachel. For those that don't know know me, as Amber said, and what a wild ride it's been to get to where I am today. <laughs> there is so much. Um, so a little bit about my background. My master's is in clinical social work. I was in the field for many years. I had a number of different jobs in the field. And about a year and a half ago, I discovered the online coaching world. I didn't even know that it existed. I was like, what did I do on Instagram before knowing about all these coaches? Like, what was I doing? <laughs> and I was pretty burnt out in the therapy world, as many fellow therapists are, and was at a point in my journey where I was about to get licensed. So I was just, you know, hours away from finishing all of my required clinical hours, submitting the paperwork, all of that when I discovered Amber and this business coaching program that I did and decided that traditional therapy field was just not for me. So I ended up taking a full leap into the coaching world. Everyone thought I was batshit crazy because I had literally saved these hours and worked for them for like eight years all to get to this like finish point of getting licensed. And right before that was about to happen, the universe was like, uh-uh, we are pivoting. So pivoted to the online coaching space and created my business, Rachel Kelly Coaching, about a year and a half ago. And about three weeks into my journey of starting this business that has been more than I could have ever anticipated, um, I ended up meeting my coach and my mentor who trained me in her healing method. And she had worked under Dr. Gabor Mate, who's a world-renowned um, physician who specializes in childhood relational trauma, attachment wounding. And so she really opened up this entire world for me that really deepened the training that I had already done in the therapy world in a way where it all just kind of clicked together. And at this time, I had been leaving my partner because my anxious attachment was so active and so alive. And my whole body was like, you need help for this. You need to go get some healing for yourself. And that's one of the many reasons that the traditional therapy field didn't really feel aligned was because I feel like we were really, you know, not practicing what we were preaching. So I was helping clients, but I myself had this very activated attachment wound that I had not tended to yet. So I started my own intensive trauma healing, anxious attachment healing journey. And yeah, this July will be two years and it has completely changed my life and completely changed how I work with my clients. So I've shifted from, you know, working in a DVT center, drug and alcohol center, like all these different modalities to really niching into relational trauma and attachment wound healing. Um, and so I'm really excited to talk more about, you know, anxious attachment today and how we heal it and build that internal safety because it truly is a game changer. Mm -hmm. I remember when I went to school and my training is marriage and family therapy. And we spent a little bit of time talking about attachment theory, but really it was kind of in the context of that developmental perspective, right? Where it's like, okay, John Bowlby, and like, here are the different types of attachment. And here's why it's important that parents attend to their children. And if they don't, it could manifest in these ways. But we really didn't talk about all of the different nuanced ways it's not so straightforward. It's not so cut and dry. Um, you can have all of your physical needs tended for, but there's also emotional needs. There's needs in terms of our communication styles. There's needs in terms of emotional and psychological safety. Um, I feel like we didn't really talk about it all that much in graduate school. And so much like you, it wasn't until later on that I saw all the different ways that attachment really does play out a role in how we relate, right? Not only to each other, but also how we relate to ourselves, our environment, literally everything. Um, and I started using it a lot in especially the therapy work that I was doing with, um, you know, couples or people in any type of relationship dynamic. And a lot of people were like completely mind blown when we would discover their attachment style and explain so much about 
themselves and why they were, you know, acting the way that they were acting or feeling the way that they were feeling. And so for the people who don't know, can you share a little bit about attachment styles, how people might kind of find out what their attachment style is and how you discovered your own attachment style? Yeah, definitely. So just to piggyback off of what you were saying, I also didn't learn about attachment styles in graduate school, which still to this day blows my mind. I'm like, how? How are we training to be therapists and we're not taught these very important styles that shape so much of how we relate to, like you said, literally everything? So for those that don't know or are not familiar with attachment theory, there's four main types of attachment styles. So the one that we're all, you know, working towards is secure attachment. So this means that we can feel safe both in relating to ourselves and to other people. So from a childhood perspective, this looks like, you know, mom leaves for work and child maybe feels a little bit of emotion, but they feel safe that mom's going to return. There's not that deep fear of abandonment. The other three attachment styles are more insecure. So there's disorganized, which is fearful avoidant. It has a million different names, but we'll just call it disorganized. Um, and this is where you have both that anxious and avoidant side. So you really, really want intimacy, but you're also equally terrified of it. So maybe during childhood, this looked like feeling anxiously attached to your parent, meaning you're not sure if you're going to get your needs met. You're not sure if mom's coming back. You're not sure, you know, if your emotional needs are going to be attuned to, but you also may experience some fear around your primary caregiver. So it can feel really confusing for a child because you really want that parent's attention and for them to meet your needs, but you're also maybe fearful or scared to ask up for what you need or, um, you know, there's that, that push and pull feeling. So as adults, we develop this disorganized style where we really want that intimacy, whether it's with a partner or um, a friend or anyone else that is close to us in our lives, but we're also equally as afraid of that intimacy. It does not feel safe. And then we have dismissive avoidance. So this you might just hear as, you know, your typical avoidantly attached person. This is where intimacy just does not feel safe at all. So it is safer to kind of um, pull back inward rather than, you know, relating to the person in a vulnerable way. So avoidantly attached people might avoid communication. They might, um, you know, not express their feelings in a romantic relationship. Their partner might be having to guess, like, how are they feeling? They might, you know, numb out their feelings more with substances or distractions because they are just very avoidant of their feelings. It just does not feel safe to them. And then we have anxious attachment, which is the attachment style that I have developed. And it really is that, I mean, the common thing with all of these insecure attachment styles, but they all have in common is that deep fear of abandonment. It just shows up in different ways. So with an avoidant partner where they're kind of like pulling back, the anxiously attached person, they're grasping on for dear life. So, for example, um, ways that this showed up in my childhood, my mom would leave for work in the morning. We would say goodbye. I would need to have the last word be I love you because I was so afraid of something happening where I wasn't going to see her again. And then I would run upstairs to the living room, look out the window. We would like wave again. It was like that never wanting to say goodbye feeling like I'm just going to grasp on, grasp on, grasp on. And we would wave again, and then finally she would leave. I would watch her drive away. You know, like, it also shows up in romantic relationships, constantly checking your phone. Did this person respond? Did they, you know, being so hyper vigilant to their emotions? Like, did they send an emoji? Like, I've literally had moments, um, both with myself and talking it through with clients, where they're like, oh, well, you know, he didn't send a heart emoji, and so what does that mean? And, like, really starting to overanalyze and obsess over every single detail because there's that deep fear of abandonment. So the common thing with all these is really just children needing that attunement. So what attunement actually means is just the parent being in tune with the child's emotions. So, so many people focus on, you know, well, my parents loved me. I had such a good childhood. Like I had all my 
needs met. I used to say the same thing because it's true. My parents did love me. They did the absolute best they could and they were wonderful parents. And we live in a world where our parents have their own dysregulated nervous systems because they're running to work. They're trying to pay the bills. They're trying to feed their children. They're in survival mode. They're in that go, go, go sympathetic state where it's just nonstop survival mode. And so children pick up on that stress that their parents are feeling at the end of the day. In combination with every child has a different psychological makeup. So it would be nearly impossible to expect any parent to be able to properly attune to their child 100% of the time. That's just not the world we live in. And so it's almost expected that we all grow up with at least some reparenting, some, you know, healing from childhood that needs to be done. Maybe some more than others, or it shows up in different ways, but it's kind of just expecting that we all have stuff to process from childhood. And that's okay. It totally makes sense. So that's kind of the the gist of the four different attachment styles. What was your light bulb moment when you realized for you all of, not all of, but like a lot of what was causing you stress, dysregulation, um, you know, unhealthy um, relating in, you know, relationships and to self? Do you remember having some light bulb moment where you were like, oh my gosh, like this really this goes back to my attachment style and it goes back to this and this is why this and you really started to just connect the dots yeah absolutely so the best potent information for discovering your attachment style is your romantic relationships Mm -hmm. you know in childhood the child parent relationship is that primary attachment and then we grow up and we end up finding romantic partners and then we replicate those same patterns with those romantic partners where, you know, our attachment style really comes out. Our romantic partners see different sides of us that maybe our friends or our coworkers or neighbors or other people may not see. So for me, my romantic relationships and my dating history connected all the dots. But as you said, since we're not taught about this, there were so many relationships where I would get really triggered that fear of abandonment would be so active in me but i had no idea what was happening and so it just felt like my body's triggers and visceral reactions were kind of taking over and i had no understanding or name for it i had no way of understanding like why am i feeling the way i'm feeling right now Mm -hmm. so when i look back to like my most significant three relationships in my life This anxious attachment showed up with each one, but it showed up a little bit differently based on my partner's attachment style. So for example, Oh, interesting. Okay. uh, So for example, my first serious relationship, he was more avoidant. And so, you know, when he wasn't communicating or, you know, when I was fearing that abandonment subconsciously and I was kind of graspy and um, I would get really triggered with just these things that like just trying to control behavior so like he would always run late and it wasn't just like oh that's annoying he's late again you know it was like this deep reaction of like he doesn't I would make it mean a lot like he doesn't respect my time he can't show up for me you know and the way that I would get triggered now I understand it was really triggering this sense that like my you know, my mom wasn't showing up for me in the way that I needed her to. And so that little version of me, my inner child, little Rachel, she was like, oh, why isn't he showing up? And it's this fear and this anticipation, right? So that's what showed up a lot with him. And he was more avoidant, so he wouldn't communicate as much about his feelings. And he had like a lot of numbing behaviors that felt really unsafe for me. So that's one way it showed up in that relationship. The next one, my partner had let's see, for him, it would be more either anxious or disorganized, like kind of a combination. I'm not exactly sure I'd have to sit with that one, but whatever it was, it made me feel so safe. Like I had never felt more safe with a partner. He would show up for me. He would hold me while I cried. He was there throughout a lot of my grief when my mom passed away. 
He would communicate his feelings. He would write down his feelings in cards. Like he was very expressive. And so it made me feel so, so safe and so seen. And what I didn't realize at that time was it was actually kind of placating to my anxious attachment. So if the anxious attachment is this thing that gets active when you feel unsafe, it almost like settled it where I was like, oh, I feel like pretty calm and rational in this relationship. And I was like, oh, maybe, you know, it's just because this person is like the one, like this is the one I'm supposed to be with. And, you know, not to say that there wasn't a very strong connection between us, but looking back, I can really see that his attachment style had led him to really prioritize others before himself. And that was kind of similar to me. So we were both kind of codependent together where we were just like latching onto each other. And so we both just felt so held and super seen and so cared for. And there was so much safety that was built in the other. But this relationship happened pretty unexpectedly before I was supposed to move to California. So we knew that there was an end date to it. And looking back, I can see that when I moved, it literally felt like I was going to die without him. And that's how I knew that my anxious attachment was so strong in the sense that he was my safety instead of me being my safety. Mm Mm-hmm. And it was the same thing for him. He went into like a deep depression after I moved and we were both just incredibly heartbroken because it was like breaking up because I was moving, not necessarily because we wanted to break up. But it was one of those things where we were like, we're going to we're going to sign up for this knowing it's going to fucking hurt in a few months. But we know it's worth it to just experience, you know, the time that we do have together. And when I moved and I felt that just like deep deep fear. Um, I almost considered moving back for him. That's how strong my anxious attachment was. I did not feel safe to just be with the pain of that heartbreak. Felt like I would not be able to be happy without him. And there's so many layers with that too, because when you involve someone in, you know, grief and all of that, it just, it's, it's a lot, right? It kind of, um, is another added layer of why he made me feel so safe. And then the most recent relationship that actually was the catalyst for me doing this healing work, um, he was the first partner that did not placate to my anxious attachment. So when I say placate, I mean I get triggered. Like let's say he does something, I get triggered, and I immediately relate to him as if, like think about child parent, as if it's his responsibility to make me feel better. Mm. I used to rely on him heavily for you know, comforting me, validating me, you know, doing all the things to help me feel safe. And he was actually the first person that was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Not in such a direct way of like, no, I'm not like, it wasn't like mean like that. It was more of just like, he was able to notice that grasping feeling that I was having with him. It, it made him want to distance himself under some, oh, cause it, With anxious attachment, it can often feel suffocating for the other person. So it was really hard to take an honest look at all these relationships and like, oh my God, I was suffocating them. I was like, hold me, take care of me, you know, make me feel better. And he was the first person that was just like, we're going to take some space right now. Like when we would get into conflict or arguments. And it was the first time that I really had to be with that deep, deep fear that would come up for me. And I would get so dysregulated. I would just be crying so much. I would not feel safe in my body. I felt like he was going to abandon me. And keep in mind, as adults, we can't actually be abandoned because we are able to meet our own needs. We're able to, you know, support ourselves and, you know, provide for ourselves. Whereas in childhood, if our parent leaves us, we actually may not survive. So that's the biggest difference is we can't be abandoned as adults. And so in this relationship, when this fear of abandonment kept showing up, I was like, something is going on here, like something really strong in my body. Like the fact that my body had this visceral reaction where it was so hard for me to feel regulated until he came back and reassured me like everything's okay. Like, you know, giving me a hug, all those things. I didn't fully know at that time that that was little me, that she was feeling so, so scared. 
And so that was the breakup that led me to starting this work because I was like, I need to heal this thing because this thing is running my life. It's running rampant. So um, that's when I began my my deep healing journey. And it's not that we broke up because of the anxious attachment. It was more so I believe that every relationship serves a really deep purpose. And that purpose was to really highlight the way in which my anxious attachment was fully running my life. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And we hear this a lot in very simple terms when, you know, when I was primarily working with relationships, there was always, almost always like a pursuer and a runner, right? Almost always, because we subconsciously will seek out people based on our attachment style. And this is the thing that a lot of people don't realize. So if you are raised in a situation where like you're codependent with your parents, you're going to find somebody who will be codependent with you. If you are expecting somebody to not show up for you based on your attachment style, most likely subconsciously, you're going to pick somebody who's going to fulfill that construct because you are expecting and anticipating them to not show up for you. So we are constantly fulfilling this blueprint that was mapped out for us in early childhood and finding people to fit that role. And then we're like, why is this cycle keep repeating over and over and over again? And it's because we subconsciously are doing this whole plug and play situation and we're not even aware that we're doing it. And that's where bringing awareness into it, even being able to be like, oh my gosh, this is my attachment style. This is why I developed that attachment style. And this attachment style isn't actually serving me is a huge game changer for a lot of people. Just having that awareness and being able to take responsibility for it because it does take a lot of work to heal attachment wounds, a lot of work, a lot of constant and ongoing work. Um, but at least then you're aware of why you're showing up the way that you're showing up and what is your shit versus what is you know the people that you're in relationship to, what's their shit and being able to take ownership of your shit. Um, and so for the person listening who's like, okay, cool. So I think I'm a whatever attachment style, what now? What would you say to them in terms of getting started on a journey to be able to heal some of these attachment wounds and doing some reparenting work? Because to the point that you made, like it's been a journey and a process. Yeah. And like you said, it is probably some of the hardest work that you could ever choose to do. But what I go back to always is choosing your heart. So when I was dysregulated in those relationships, that was really hard. And also being with the pain of processing the attachment wounding from childhood is also really hard. But one allows me to heal it and shift it and develop a more secure attachment style for myself, whereas the other one just continues to keep me stuck in suffering. So it's always about choosing your heart. In terms of beginning a healing journey of actually healing and shifting it, it's really dependent on how committed you are to healing it. Um, and so if you're in a place where you're just starting to like learn about this stuff, maybe the first step is just curiosity. So maybe next time you get into a conflict with your partner or um, you notice some anxiety arise when you're communicating with, you know, either your partner or your boss. I mean, this can show up at work. It could show up with friends. And you notice that anxiety arise in your body, even just taking a moment before responding and creating space between when that trigger or that activation gets prompted and how you're responding to it and just being like, what's actually happening for me? So much of us block, so many of us block ourselves from even exploring what's happening in a really honest way because there's so much shame around it. Because if we don't understand what's happening, we just feel crazy. Like I used to always tell my friends, when I was in relationships, I felt like the craziest girlfriend in the world. Like it reminds me of that show, The Crazy Ex-Girlfriend or whatever. And then when I was single, I felt like just so secure, so confident, so connected to myself. And I was like, where's the disconnect? Right? I didn't realize that that was where the anxious attachment wound was getting triggered. So when we feel so much shame around it because we either make it mean something about ourselves or we just think we're crazy because we just don't have the insight or the understanding or the awareness to really be like, oh, this is what's happening. 
we then block ourselves from getting curious. So even if today all you're able to do is take a step in, you know, getting curious around what's happening in your body, putting your hands on your heart, taking a few deep breaths and just being like, what sensations am I feeling right now? And being able to sit with that and then bringing yourself back to, even if it's not full regulation, if, you know, you're still learning how to do that because that is a learning process. Even if it just brings a little bit more awareness and allows you to respond in maybe a different way than before, that's huge in and of itself. If you're like me, where you're like, this thing is driving my life, I'm tired of it getting in the way of my relationships, my business, I mean, literally everything, and most of all, just tired of feeling the way that I was feeling around um, my own attachment and my anxiety, um, the most important thing is to really prioritize healing. So for me, when I invested in my healing, I had just quit both of my therapy jobs. I did not have my business yet. I think I had one, yeah, I had one client at that point. So not even enough income to like fully support myself. But I just knew in my entire body that if I did not heal this and prioritize it, I wasn't going to grow my business. I wasn't going to feel any better. Like I just knew that it had to be a priority. So for me, I ended up, you know, putting my coach on a credit card and was like, I'll figure it out. Like I trust that this will be paid off and there's no better investment than investing in my healing. And so if you are ready for that level of commitment, it's really finding a person that you want to go all in with. Like I found my mentor and I was like, I'm all in. Like, as soon as she's speaking, I feel seen. I felt like it just resonated in every cell of my being. And I was like, I need to work with this person. So if you're hearing this and you're like, okay, I'm ready to like fully commit, you know, really taking time. And I, I think you and I have spoken about this before, of like taking time to find a person that feels aligned, right? Because you can go on Instagram and there's like, a bajillion coaches advertising their services. There's a million therapists. Like, it's really about who do you feel just gets like when they speak and you're like, oh, that's me. She gets it. She's walked the walk. She's experienced it. Because for me, that was the most important difference is, you know, I'd been in therapy my whole life. I'd literally seen probably over 10 different therapists and none of them, you know, they helped me to a certain extent, but none of them had really done the deep healing work that I was seeking to do. And so that's how I knew that my mentor was the right one for me because she had really done the work on herself, which is why she was able to help me. And because I'm doing the work on myself, I'm able to, you know, allow my clients to do the same. So you really have to look at someone and say, okay, they're preaching about all this stuff, but like, what does their nervous system feel like? Where are they at in their own healing? If they're talking about prioritizing healing, how are they prioritizing their own healing? And really looking for, you know, that right fit. And then when you do, it's really choosing like this is going to take priority and remembering your why. Just like with anything else in life, why? Why are you committing to this? Why are you, for me, it was like, why am I investing in this when I don't even have any income right now? Why am I, you know, choosing to say no to going out to a bar on a Friday night with friends and, you know, staying home and journaling and meditating and like, connecting with my inner child, right? Like really focusing on why. And for me, it was always, I just don't want to feel that way anymore. Like I knew, I knew that healing was possible. I knew that my life could be so different if I actually allowed myself to prioritize myself. And as someone who has been so codependent and had, you know, this childhood where I was, um, you know, really sick as a kid. And then in combination with my mom experiencing a lot of her own anxious attachment and some borderline sy symptoms, I was so codependent with her. I wasn't fully like safe to choose myself. Right. And so it was a really scary thing to be like, oh, I'm going to choose me. I'm not going to, you know, prioritize everyone else above myself and choose me. And that was terrifying, especially if you're not used to it. So just being able to have someone to co-regulate with you 
especially in this, you know, coaching modality where we're able to have contact with our clients daily instead of just that once a week session, we really get to like do life with someone and know that on those day-to-day moments where you got triggered or where, you know, you're just feeling like overwhelmed with emotion, like knowing that you can, you know, talk to someone who's just going to get it and show you that it really is safe to choose you. And that it's actually the most selfless thing that you can do because it shifts how you relate to everyone. And it's a healing domino effect where because you relate differently and you're not relating through an activated inner child anymore, that person is able to, you know, maybe relate differently to themselves or look at something a different way. So it truly is just like the gift that keeps on giving. So, you know, that's a long-winded answer, but really just (laughs) Make the decision to choose you and then take baby steps towards, you know, finding the right support. Yeah. And I think, you know, because you brought it up and because this is the Sacred Leadership Podcast um, and because you and I have had these discussions in the past, choosing somebody who is good to work with, I think, is a worthwhile conversation to have because especially when we're talking about attachment wounding, you're, you know, okay, I'm carrying these wounds. And so then how am I choosing somebody based out of these wounds? Because there's a lot of coaches out there, a lot of unethical therapists out there who, you know, love the codependent client, right? Like, okay, like you want me to be your savior? I will be your savior. Just give you all, give me all of your money. Right. Right. And that's going to feel really good, right? Because it's placating that anxious attachment. It's, it's giving you that codependent relationship where it's like, okay, I can talk to my coach every day, Voxer, here I come, you know? And then you have, you've just replaced one thing for another, essentially, and you're not actually getting any type of healing. And the piece that you said that really stood out to me was finding somebody who is walking the walk, not just talking the talk. And this, you know, for full transparency, I still work as a therapist. And it is also one of my biggest issues with therapy and like the field of therapy is, you know, as a therapist, you're not bringing yourself really into that session. Um, you know, we talk about the blank slate and how that's very weird and not necessarily a very helpful way to communicate or connect with our clients. Um, but it, it, there is a certain level of ethics and safety that's involved, but also how that's not very human. And most of the time, even if we're coming in there unbiased, blank slate, neutral, um, you know, unconditional positive regard. Unless we have done our own work and are doing our own work, because it's never done, let's be honest, we're going to harm our clients. We are absolutely going to harm our clients. I'm sure you have heard a million horror stories when it comes to coaches and therapists. I have heard a million horror stories when it comes to coaches and therapists. And all I can think to myself is like, wow, that is a person who has a lot of ego, has no awareness is very much operating like in their own wounds Mm -hmm. and is really in this for all the wrong reasons and therefore they are being harmful whether there it's their intention to be harmful or not that really doesn't matter so when we're thinking about finding people who are not only talking the talk but walking the walk what can you give to people in terms of things to look for, questions to ask, um, especially in the realm of working with somebody to heal attachment wounds? Yeah. I mean, you just have so much to say on this because like you said, you and I have, we've lived it and we've been in the field long enough to have seen it because, you know, all the stuff we learn in school, like come in with a blank slate. It doesn't mean that the therapist isn't actually projecting their shit all over the client, even if, quote unquote, they're like, oh, I'm being a blank slate. Um, it also is just limiting in terms of the human to human connection that you can have with someone. So, you know, I think in terms of looking for someone, for me, it was just like, okay, I want to heal my anxious attachment. Does this person have experience with healing their own? attachment. And so for my coach, it was, yes, she had anxious attachment. She, and that doesn't mean that, you know, like you can't work with other clients that have different attachment styles. It's just like, has this person worked on their own 
attachment style? And are they actually able to take radical accountability and honesty when their own stuff comes up? Because it will. Mm. Oh, Rachel, huge one right there. Go yeah. for it. Because it absolutely will, because we're human, right? Mm -hmm. My stuff comes up with my clients, and that's why I have a support person to be like, okay, I need to process this to make sure that I'm not projecting my shit all over to the client because that's not what they're paying me for. That's, that's not what they're here for. Um, and being able to also have that role modeled for me when, you know, something comes up for my coach and her actually saying like, oh, this just triggered this in me or this is, you know, not so that it's then my job to process it, but more so I can see that, you know, she's taking re responsibility for her own stuff. And that alone in and of itself is so incredibly healing and reparative because I'm sure a lot of people can relate, but during childhood, it is pretty rare when we have parents that can take full ownership of their stuff <laughs> because again, that blocker of shame comes in. You know, if I had any complaint or not even complaint, if I was just expressing how you know, something my mom did made me feel, it would be like, oh, I'm a terrible mother, right? It would be like her projecting her own fears onto me. And so she was never able to fully be like, oh, okay, I see, you know, what I did there, how that made you feel. And so being able to have someone who's like, oh yeah, that was my stuff coming up. Not, not to feel shame around it, not to, you know, point fingers or blame, but just to be like, we're two human beings having a deeply connected relationship, it's inevitable that our stuff is going to come up. So as much as a therapy world trains us to be this blank slate, we can't take the human out of us. We're still human. And I think that was one of the reasons why my soul felt so like sucked in that field was because it felt like I was trying to fit into this role that didn't feel natural, right? Mm -hmm can't tell you the amount of times that I've had clients specifically in my anxiously attached group, they've told me hearing about your anxious attachment and how you healed it has been so inspiring and healing for me to do it. Because when you're entering this deep healing journey and you are really getting to know yourself on this whole deep level that maybe you didn't even know before, and you're connecting the parts that have been disconnected because trauma disconnects us from our true authenticity, from our true selves. And when you're, when you're entering that, it can feel so hard and challenging and you almost feel lost, right? And so to have someone that's like, I have been where you have been. I know exactly how you feel in this moment. Maybe not exactly, maybe it's showing up differently, but like, I can relate. I get it. I even had a, a session right before this where my client was talking about how uh, she's healing and she's doing this work with me. She's feeling more disconnected from her friendships. And I told her, I said, listen, I know this is maybe not what you want to hear, but I promise you this is a part of the journey. This is a very normal part where the more connected you feel to yourself, the more disconnected you might feel from those other people that have been your source of safety have been a way of, you know, relating through things that just felt familiar. I mean, we oftentimes bond over our trauma responses subconsciously, right? We're not like intending to do this. But then when we start relating in a different way and then we feel disconnected, we're like, oh, this feels weird and lonely. And like, you're just in this interim period where you're not quite who you used to be, but you're still kind of blossoming into like your highest self. Um, and so I think it just goes back to feeling seen by the person, feeling like they're actually practicing what they preach. So mm -hmm. I'm telling a client, I want you to get still with yourself when you're feeling triggered. Or even if you're not feeling triggered and you're having a busy day at work, I want you to practice just taking some moments for yourself. And if I'm not doing that, and then I'm preaching that to my clients, that makes me a hypocrite. Right. And it also doesn't position me to actually be able to guide them through obstacles that come up. So like, oh, it's been a really busy day and it just feels hard to settle in. And I'm like, yeah, I totally relate because I've had busy days where it takes really intentional time to be like, I need to ground right now. I need to take time for me right now. 
that's not something that we're encouraged to do in the therapy world or, you know, in our society in general. So I think, again, like if someone's telling you, I walk the walk, okay, well, tell me more about that. Like, what has your own healing journey looked like? I'd love to hear it because oftentimes it's hearing the other person's healing journey that is what allows the person to feel seen. Like, oh, this person has been through it. They've been through like the depths of hell and then they come out the other side and look at what they've been able to do because of their healing and look at how they're feeling because of their healing. And even the nonverbal stuff is what I look out for too. I always tell people, I'm like, even if you don't even have a conversation with someone, but you're just following them on Instagram and you're like, hmm, should I work with them or not? Look at their energy. Like, how do you actually feel in your body when you're listening to them? Do you feel like there's this like anxious, frenetic energy and they're just like, go, 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 go. And they're just like, you know, kind of spiking your dopamine. Like I got to a point where I literally had to, <laughs> I had to mute the stories of a lot of business coaches because I noticed that my dopamine was like, it was like this offer and this offer. And it was like, I was getting so overwhelmed that I was like, this is not, it doesn't feel good in my body. And it sends me down this rabbit hole that's just not helpful for me. So I ended up having to be like very intentional with what content I was absorbing. And so I recommend that to anyone, whether it's a business coach or a therapist or a different kind of healer, like how do you actually feel when you listen to them and what does their energy feel like to you? And if it feels like nourishing or safe or expansive or just grounded and you're like, oh, I want to feel like that. I want to feel grounded. It's like, okay, maybe, maybe that's a potential fit. But if you're listening to them and you're like, I feel like this person needs to take a deep breath and it makes you want to take a deep breath, then maybe that's not the energy that you want to be around all day when you're working in a very intimate, high level container with someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I tell people a lot because I, you know, I got this question quite often in terms of like, what questions do I ask or what should I look for? Um, and I, I usually break it down in that. Do you feel like this person, the way that they're showing up gives you permission, right? Like, are you looking at them and being like, wow, they did it. I can do it too. Um, and the other piece of it is practice, right? Do you feel like they're a safe person to be able to practice whatever it is that you are looking to step into. So in this case, it would be practice what it would be like to be in a relationship with somebody who is securely attached. You get to operate as a securely attached person. How would that actually feel? You actually get to then practice what that interaction would be like. And is this person able to model for you what that's going to be like? Because to your point, it's one thing for your coach or, you know, your mentor, whoever it is that you're working with to be like, okay, like that triggered me. This is what's going on for me in my body as an example or as something that they're modeling. And they're like, this is how I regulated versus someone that's like, oh, that triggered me. Like, I need you to help me process through this, or I need you to then hold space for me. That's, that's just another way of like trauma bonding. Right. Um, and that is, it's not your responsibility to regulate your coach, your mentor, the person that you're going to for healing. And I think that's where people are like, oh my gosh, my coach is looking to me for you know, help and gut. And like, no, 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 no. If you are paying them, if they are the people that are showing up to hold space for you, they can still share their lived experience. They can still share what's present, what's going on for them, but not in a way that causes you to feel any type of obligation towards holding space for them or having those roles be reversed. Yeah. Um, and I think that this, like, you've probably experienced this in therapy containers. I've experienced this in therapy containers. I became a therapist because I went to so many different therapy sessions where I was like, I can do this shit. Like, I remember being like 14, 15 years old and basically running my own therapy sessions. Yeah. And then like, I was like 15 and my therapist is telling me about like their marital problems. Like, right. Which is like also what was happening at home. So I'm like, Wow, what the it must be me. Like I must be the problem here. Um, or I'd be like getting blood work done and the phlebotomist was like, Yeah, you know, I'm having fertility issues and like I don't know if we should just adopt or not. And I'm like, Do I have like tell me your deepest, darkest secrets like on my forehead? Like what, what am I doing here? 
Yeah. Um, and so it took me a well, really you know, like, <laughs> right. And it took me a really long time to be able to find a therapist who like I would basically like show up and be like, all right, yeah, like I'm just gonna sit here and like I'll run my own therapy session. They were like, that's interesting that you feel like you can't let me like you know interject or whatever. And I'm like, excuse me, yeah. I are you like calling me out on my own shit or something? Like, is that how this actually works? Yeah. Um, like and that, that like final therapist, it was like the boss therapist, right? The like final therapist who finally showed me what therapy in an ethical safe container looked like. That was actually when I was like, oh my gosh. And luckily I had that example because we don't learn jack shit about that in school. Mm -hmm. Like we learn nothing about how to actually show up in a way that is going to be like, yes, we learn ethics, but when it comes down to the actual human interaction of, you know, when you're sitting with somebody and your stuff is being brought up, like, it's like, cool, go get supervision after the fact. But what are we doing to regulate ourselves in and out of the therapy setting so that we're able to actually stay present in that moment? Yeah. That's not that's what we're talking about in graduate school right. and it ends up being this trial by fire situation where they're like, you know what, we're just going to shove you into working with really high acuity populations as a complete novice therapist yep. and we're going to overbook you and then you're just going to figure it out as you go while you're super stressed out. Oh, by the way, you're broke because like you have student loans and you're not going to be able to afford housing or food um, and, you know, we hope that we you do a really good job like being ethical with these people, even though you yourself are not going to be okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I once had a supervisor that was like, oh, please tell me if you're feeling overwhelmed because they had assigned me like 15 people all at once. And in our private supervision, I was like, oh yeah, I I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. She then used that to go to the director and was like, we need to extend Rachel's probation period because it was still like a newer job. She said she's feeling overwhelmed. And I'm like, why do you literally just ask me how I was feeling? <laughs> It's like, yeah, that's literally how that happens. They just throw you in and be like, okay, good luck. Figure it out. We, we're here for supervision, but the supervision is actually not going to be helpful at all. Oh, it's such a domino. And just something that you said I think is important too of like, it's such a balance between if you're going to a therapist where they're just using it to process their own stuff, which I've heard so many horror stories about that. Um, and then if you're like me or um, like one of my friends too, we both kind of has have struggled with this. Sometimes it can be the opposite where especially if you are processing stuff from childhood and you have just have like a lot of needs that your inner child just did not get met at that time. And sometimes when like I would have instances where my coach were, even if she showed like some emotion to what I said and I would be like, uh oh, like, is this okay? Like, da da da, you know, and it yeah. would be this other rigid extreme of like, she's my therapist. She can't have any like feelings about this. And that's not actually helpful either because it's role modeling a human relationship. So, you know, the, the level of um, attachment I have with her is very representative of the attachment I would have, you know, with a parent as a child or, um, as adults in a romantic relationship where they're really seeing all parts of you. And so it's only natural that the other person is going to have their own emotion. It's how they then relate to that, right? That's mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. It's like you don't want a robot that doesn't have any emotions or have any natural responses or like if my anxious attachment, you know, there have been times where um I didn't know this at the time, but through uncovering a lot of this, we realized that I was trying to seek validation or seeking my needs met in like sneaky ways because as a child, I didn't fully feel safe to just be like, this is what I need. And so if we don't feel safe in childhood to just directly communicate what we need, oftentimes we don't even know what we need because we're children, then it can come out in like sneaky ways. And so my coach would call me out on this and be like, oh, like, are you asking for this? Because it kind of is coming out in the sideways way. And, you know, when she's able to to call me out on that, but then also say, you know, this is how it felt for me when you did that. Not to make it about her, not to make it about, oh, no, I need to comfort her. No, it's 
to help highlight that when I'm in a relationship, that's probably what my partner is experiencing. And so for her to be able to see that and see how I'm relating in a very intimate, like vulnerable, you know, attached relationship, she's able to call out when I'm behaving in a way that's not actually helpful. And then it allows me to shift it and be, you know, sit with the shame that comes with that and, you know, be more aware of it. So it's kind of looking at like either extreme, like if you go into a therapy office and you're asking them anything about themselves, like, oh, do you have a dog? And they're like, I can't self-disclose that, right? Like, <laughs> like you become so rigid where you don't know anything about this person. Like probably not someone you're going to really feel that deeply connected to, but if it's the other way where like they're self-disclosing in a way that's not actually for the benefit of the client or not actually helpful, that's something you also want to look at. And that's why healing is an art form. It's like this balance that's never going to be like 100% yes or no, right or wrong. It's going to be just this balance of like, do you feel cared for? Do you feel like when conflict comes up, because conflict will come up in any, you know, attached relationship, are you able to work through it in a way that's going to be helpful for you to then work through it with other people in your life? And the challenging part about that is that not everyone is doing the healing work. So, you know, they may not be able to work through it with you in the same way. But the point is that it's so repairing for that younger part of yourself that didn't have that parent or that person taking responsibility that just blamed on the child. And you have to remember that children always make it mean something about us. We always mm -hmm. analyze it as our fault. So to be able to have someone that like works through conflict with you in a way that's like, this is your part and this is what we have to work on. And this is also, you know, my part in it, like just working through conflict in, in a much healthier way and taking responsibility for each each part of it, it's so reparative for that inner child. So I think when you're looking for a therapist or a coach or a healer, like, you know, can they take responsibility for that? Can they, you know, just be human while also self-disclosing in an intentional way, in a way that feels like it's still in service of the client and in service of the relationship? Because at the end of the day, I don't care if you're, you know, doing DBT, CBT, whatever it is, like relational healing is the therapeutic relationship. That is the healing mm -hmm. that we relate differently. And that is how we heal um, through feeling safe with other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I honestly like that is a big part of why. Um, why I started this podcast, because I feel like I was having a lot of these conversations, you know, essentially behind closed doors, right? Like in the DMs um, with you and with a lot of other people. And people kept coming back to me being like, well, there has to be, you know, some way of standardizing this. There has to be some way of like, you know, if you know that such and such went to so and so, you know, certification program, then they're going to be good. And uh, and unfortunately, that's not how it works. It doesn't matter what letters you have after your name. It doesn't matter if you're licensed or unlicensed. It doesn't matter if you're certified or not certified. It doesn't matter. You could have gone through every single training that is offered out there. But unless you are and have been doing your own work and are willing to sit with yourself and sit with your own ego and sit with your why for doing the work that you're doing on a very consistent basis, you probably will be harmful to the people that you are looking to work with. And so I've always said that the solution here is about educating the client. It doesn't matter if it's a therapy client, a healing client, a coaching client, it doesn't matter. It's about educating the people who are seeking the support to know what to ask for, to know what to look for, to know what feels good and what doesn't feel good, and also empower them to listen when their intuition is like, you know what, this doesn't feel safe. This doesn't feel balanced. I actually feel scared of telling my coach the truth, or I feel like I don't want to disappoint my therapist and I can't bring that up to them. Those are the times where you really have to kind of go back in and be like, hmm, maybe this person isn't the right fit for me. Um, because unless we're able to be open and honest and, you know, to your point, holistic about the way that we're allowing ourselves to be viewed in this healing work and 
feel that emotional, psychological safety to be seen as our full selves, uh, we're going to be very limited in what we're able to receive. And yeah, it could be you. You could be the one that's like the quote unquote problem in terms of like why you feel like you can't bring this up to your coach or your therapist. Or it could also be that that is not a safe person. Um, and so I think, again, equipping people with the knowledge and the understanding to empower them to be discerning when they're choosing who to work with. And like, yes, sometimes, you know, you give your money to people and it ends up not working out or you put your trust in people and it ends up not working out and you'll learn a lot from those experiences. And maybe that was part of, you know, the journey. We don't know, you know, how things are supposed to play out, but I do think that in educating people, there can be less of those horror stories that, you know, we're all so familiar with. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's all about intentionality too, right? Because if you're hiring someone specifically for healing support and you're noticing that when you're working with them, you know, nothing's really shifting or you feel like they're maybe just focusing on like external things that aren't actually coming back to feeling how you want to feel in life or, you know, the opposite where maybe you're hiring a um, a business coach and you're really focusing on just strategy or money or whatever it might be and they're trying to be your therapist when that's not actually their role, right? And the the tricky thing is that I am in the belief that like business and healing, like they go hand in hand because if we are not healing our attachment wound, that will affect our ability to feel safe to actually expand and to create what we want to create in our lives and in our businesses. But I do just appreciate so much when people are able to just say, you know, I'm, I'm your business coach. I am just focusing on this with you and I'm here to, you know, hold and support you, but I, and not trained to do trauma healing. Like for those that actually are just ethical about it and say like, I'm not the person for you rather than, oh, I want you to keep paying me. So I'm going to just like pretend to be your therapist, your coach, your, your everything. And so like really staying in your lane and like being honest about what it is that you're able to do. So, you know, for my clients, like most of them have no idea the difference between license or unlicensed. They know the story of me burning my licensure papers and deciding not to get licensed. They know that story very well. But before that, they didn't even, one of them I had been working with for like a year and she didn't even realize that I had like clinical training. Like she just thought that I was like this life coach that was really good at dealing with emotions. And I'm like, oh no, like I, I was in the therapy <laughs> So I think it's really just a reminder, like you said, it's not about the letters behind your name. It's not about any of that. It's about like, is this person in integrity with what they're offering? So if I'm offering you business coaching and I'm talking about your inner child, but I'm not actually equipped to do that, or I don't even have experience doing that within myself, you know, like, are they able to just focus on what they're actually able to offer? And the same thing for a healer. If, you know, like I'm technically not a business coach, but because I do healing work with different entrepreneurs and I've experienced how healing my anxious attachment wound has shifted how I'm able to expand in my business, I am able to coach on that because it's something that I've lived. It's something that, you know, I have experience on and that still doesn't mean that I'm going to go out and advertise myself as a business coach if I don't feel like I'm, you know, I, I'm offering what I'm able to offer. And so I think just like you said, really looking at and asking the questions and listening to your intuition of like, am I actually feeling any differently working with this person? Or am I still waking up every day feeling stuck and anxious and suffering and not actually seeing any, you know, results or any changes, because that's probably a red flag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you have that red flag, knowing that you can bring that up to the person that you're working with and in the spirit of, you know, an ethical leader, they should be able to respond to that by validating your emotional experience and offering some type of constructive solution there, right? So if working with you, Rachel, and you're coming to me and you're like, Amber, you know, I've just really been feeling like we're hitting a dead end. Um, we've been working on the same stuff for a couple of sessions now. I just, I think we might be not be a good fit. 
being able to know that I'm not going to be like, oh, well, Rachel, that's actually you. You're the problem. You're not showing up 110%. If you were showing up, you wouldn't be having these blocks right now. So maybe you need to go steam your yoni and get your sacral center all readjusted. And then you come back. And then once you got yourself together, then because you are the problem, we'll be able to move forward. It has nothing to do with me. Mm. So you go, you go do you. And then like, that that's not how this works. And I unfortunately have seen that come up so many times where clients have brought up their experience to whether it's a business coach, a healer, even a therapist, and they get shamed and blamed and shut down. And there is a very passive aggressive response that happens. Yeah. And I will say, you know, because I know you and I have talked about this, like if you're working with somebody and they cause you to feel some type of way when you are speaking your truth, that is not a safe person to work with. That is not okay. It's not okay in relationships. It's not okay in friendships. It's not okay in a business relationship. And it's definitely not okay when you're paying somebody, most of the time, a pretty substantial sum of money, and they're going to make you feel like shit for speaking your truth. Yeah, totally. And I think it's really important to discern between when someone is doing that versus let's say you have hired a healer like there have been so many times with my own coach or with my clients where um let's say they feel a certain way or something comes up in our relationship being able to really again go it all goes back to like each person being able to take responsibility for what's theirs right so not just projecting on you know oh it's all your fault um but also they're like in full transparency in my healing journey, there have been times where I projected onto my coach because my attachment wound was activated and I was like, you didn't validate me or you didn't do this. <laughs> like, you're not, you know, like kind of making it on her and also to have someone be able to see in a clear, safe, healing, reparative way and be like, I think this is what's happening. Does that resonate for you? I think that, you know, this fear of abandonment is coming up. You know, I think this is, your anxious attachment kind of taking over, not in a way that's like gaslighting your experience, of course, but I think it can get really like slippery and tricky and blurry at times where when you're healing your trauma, a big part of healing your trauma is healing the way in which you're perceiving the world. Because if we're perceiving people or ourselves or the world through a trauma lens, we're going to be in survival mode. We're going to feel like we have to have our guards up. We're going to feel like the world is out to get us. And so if we're on guard and we're like hyper vigilant and looking around for like any one thing that the person did wrong, I used to do that with my coach. I would be like, okay, she did this wrong or, you know, like whatever it is. And I realized like it's because I didn't fully feel safe to just like surrender to the relationship and like fully trust her. It didn't mean she wasn't a safe person. It meant that my, I oftentimes because of this like anxious attachment and the, the need for validation and to get my needs met, I would project onto her and she could have easily, you know, taken that and just like, again, placated the anxious attachment. But instead she was able to lovingly call me out and be like, hey, I think this is actually what's happening. And it would lead to just this profound, like, emotional release of like, holy shit, yeah, I was projecting on you because I was deflecting from my own shame. And it goes back to the example you gave of like that leader just not being able to sit with their shame. We will avoid shame at all costs. So it's easier to project onto someone, whether you're the coach doing that to the client, or in my case, I was the client doing that to my coach. And I've had other clients do that with me. And like, being able to discern the difference between those two of someone who is safe and will lovingly call you out in order to actually aid in your healing and your shifting and your expansion versus someone who is not able to look at their own shit, not see things clearly, who is relating from that defended place and who will then just make it all your fault. That's very different because that doesn't actually help anything. That's mm -hmm. like even more harmful. So it's interesting because it can definitely go both ways. And it takes, again, someone who has walked the walk and done this work to be able to look at what is coming from a trauma response versus what is um, actually coming from like a grounded, authentic, helpful place. And it's not, some, it's not always easy to be able to tell. And that's why it takes a lot of intentionality and 
you know, developing that type of trust with someone. Because I think sometimes too, we worry about like what you were talking about before of like worrying about being codependent with the coach. Like I've had clients where they were like, I'm just fearful of being too dependent on you or like, you know, like being able to discern between some some coach who's taking your money and really like, you know, maximizing off of that codependency they feel with you versus a coach where they're showing you that it's safe to feel supported and to feel seen and held by someone, but by someone who's going to always bring it back to you, right? Mm -hmm. Because my coach is like a mirror for me and I'm a mirror for my clients. So if she's a mirror for me and the more I commit to her and the more I'm committing to myself, that type of relationship, that type of, you know, I don't like to call it dependency, but that type of attachment is allowing me to shift into a more secure attachment. Whereas if it's just, you know, oh, I want you to feel dependent on me where you don't feel safe alone without me, that's a harmful type of dependency. So there's a big difference between those two. One brings it back to you and helps you come home to you and empowers you to build that secure attachment. And one keeps you dependent on someone that just wants you to stay dependent on them. That's a very big difference. So I think that's also something to to look out for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I actually really love that you offer that, Rachel, because you're right. That is a huge thing that comes up, whether it's in a coaching relationship, a therapeutic relationship. I'm I'm actually known to be somebody who will very lovingly challenge my clients if, you know, there's a lot of pushback or like, you know, I love that my clients feel very safe to fully express themselves with me. And sometimes it it's not nice. Like, you know, sometimes like I have to be regulated. Not sometimes. I always have to be regulated. But you know, in those moments when the client's like, well, you know what, like you said this and like, I don't feel like you actually like care about me or whatever. And, you know, I'm not going to come back and be like, oh, okay, well, you know, no problem. Like, what can I do for you? What can I change? I'm actually be like, hmm, that's really interesting that that's coming up for you. Can you share a little bit more about what you're experiencing right now? Yeah. And actually feeling regulated enough in my own experience that I'm not getting triggered so that I can hold them and I can actually be a safe space for them to really follow that through and really see that it's safe for them to express their needs. It's safe for them to communicate. And I'm not going to come back at them. And oftentimes when people feel like they're getting really close to a lot of healing, that's actually when they're going to push back against their therapist or their coach, right? Because they're like, I don't want to go there. I don't want to do this. I'm going to make you fire me or I'm going to like, you know, prove that this is not a good therapeutic relationship or not a good coaching relationship. I'm going to make it you. You're the problem. And then I get to walk away from this being like, yeah, Amber, she was just the worst and it was horrible. But really what's going on is that we were getting too close to stuff that was a little bit like too tough for you at that moment. And so do we need to pull back? Do we need to go around and go a different way? And having that actually be the conversation that takes place instead of, again, me as the coach or the therapist becoming triggered and not being able to sit in that resistance with the client. Um, but then also to your point, not completely placating and being like, oh my gosh, you know, we don't have to talk about that. We're not going to go there. You're, I'm so sorry, right? Because that doesn't help anybody either. Yeah. And really modeling that secure relationship where both people are able to show up and be in responsibility and be in ownership of what it is that is actually their lived experience and what's coming up for them. So I really, 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 really love that you brought that up because sometimes there is going to be resistance and sometimes it is actually you as the client that is the quote unquote problem. But the way that your coach or therapist addresses it with you, that there is validation, but there's also love and compassion and curiosity. And you don't feel like they're getting triggered by whatever it is that you're bringing to the table, right? I think that's the really important thing. If you feel like they're reacting to you instead of responding to you, that's yeah. the red flag there. Right. Or even their ability to be like, oh, that just like activated me. I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to take mm -hmm. a moment. And modeling that. Yeah. Exactly. Modeling that so that the client is able to see like, oh, they're human too. They also get triggered, but they're not going to dump it on me. They're actually going to take a moment to regulate and notice 
oh, that just, you know, struck something in me. I'm just going to take a moment. Like I've had sessions where, you know, I've had to just say like, oh, I'm going to just take a breath with that. I'm just going to sit with that. Right. Because I think we're so eager to like respond right away that we're not always responding in the more in the most intentional way. And like you said, that resistant, that resistance is everything. Because first of all, if you're doing really productive, valuable healing work, guarantee there's going to be resistance. There's no way around the resistance. And the resistance is there to protect you. It's like, you know, oh, this feels scary. So I'm going to put up this wall. And the interesting thing that I've noticed working with clients is that resistance can show up in very sneaky ways. So like I'll have a client where anytime we start to like get to some really deep layers, she'll all of a sudden say she's really tired. And it's like her her body will just be like, oh no, we're not going there. That doesn't feel safe. And so I've had her come into relationship with the fatigue or with the brain fog or with, you know, whatever that protector is and be like, can we come into relationship with this resistance? What does it have to say? You know, what is it trying to protect you from? What is the fear around this? And it's so valuable. And so when, you know, resistance does come up and the therapist either takes that personally, they make it mean something about them or they, you know, make it the client's fault or whatever it is, like you're missing such valuable you know, information and such a valuable healing opportunity to actually come into relationship with it. Because like you said, usually at that point, right, you know, right on the other side of the door, that's where like the, the really, really deep healing lies. And so to be able to work with that rather than use that as a, you know, a a wall that's being put up is everything because that's where those shifts happen. Mm. And so, I mean, to be honest, Rachel, like I'm like already plotting like part two of this podcast because I'm like, I, we could like nerd out all day about all of this stuff. And I know that there are probably people listening to this being like, I need help with that. Where do I start? So if people are listening to this and they're like, I definitely would love to invite this kind of healing into my life. How do they get connected with you? Are you accepting clients right now? Let the people know how to get some healing. Yes. Come into my office. And by office, I mean Instagram. (laughs) Anymore. Um, Yes, I am accepting clients. So right now I'm currently enrolling for, I have a specific group for anxiously attached women. So this is a four month group called Come Home to Yourself. It's also, I have it tattooed on me because it is the most, you know, profound thing that we can do for ourselves is learn how to come home to ourselves. Um, we talk about all things healing anxious attachment. There's 12 different modules, so it's kind of a course slash group combo um, where you're getting the foundational learning of, you know, attachment, inner child, nervous system, learning how all of that works. Um, in addition to weekly two-hour group calls where we're processing together, there is nothing more powerful than group healing. I was talking about resistance. I was actually very resistant to group healing. I was like, nope, I just want to do one-on-one. And then I got in a group and I was like, oh, this is what my body was trying to protect me from because it can feel really scary and vulnerable to have a group of people fully seeing you in your most raw, vulnerable self. So when I joined my first group healing program, I was like, wow, this is so just transformational. It's just incredible to be able to not only relate to other people doing the same healing work, but to feel less alone in it, to feel like you know, watching other people shift and relate differently. It's just so inspiring. So that's why I created Come Home to Yourself. Um, And then I also run a men's group called Real Men Heal, where we work on healing all the different attachment styles, rewiring the nervous system, processing that childhood trauma. And um, we currently have that group running now, but we're going to run another one soon. And they are just the most amazing men in the world. They're just like loving each other and just calling each other brothers. It's like men just need a space, right? There's not enough space in this world for men to do this healing work because it's so stigmatized. So I work with all the humans, no matter what gender you are. I work, you know, we all have the same type of nervous system that needs rewiring. Um, So the best way to find me is on Instagram. So my user is at Rachel underscore Kelly underscore coaching. Uh, my DMs are always open. And if you want to learn more about Come Home to Yourself or Real Men Heal, 
Um, I also run retreats, so many different things. You can find all the information at the link in my bio or just send me a DM because I'd love to connect. Yes. And I will link all of that stuff in the show notes for people. So they will have all the right spelling for handles and different things like that. And I think that, you know, really, Rachel, like I am so thankful that you jumped on the opportunity to come on the podcast because like I shared in the beginning, we have been in relationship to each other for a couple of years now. Um, and I really, really, really want to encourage people to feel so safe to reach out to you and to work with you um, because it's very important to me that this you know, podcast is highlighting people who are in their integrity and who are ethical practitioners. Um, and so I feel very grateful to be able to highlight you as one of those people that is safe um, for folks to come to to get you know healing because like we said, this is such a huge piece and it really is a game changer for so many people. So thank you for your time, Rachel. Thank you for this incredibly like nourishing conversation. Um, I know that a lot of people are going to find a lot of help um, in the things that we shared today. And they're also probably going to have a lot of questions. So like Rachel said, her DMs are open and we appreciate you coming on and having this chat today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I have loved this chat so, so much. And I am here to answer any questions or chat about all the things. I love talking about this, as you know. So we'll definitely have to do a part two. <laughs> but thank Sounds you. Sounds like a plan. Thanks, Rachel. Bye. There you have it. Another episode of the Sacred Leadership Podcast on the books. I hope your time spent here served you and nourished you. Join us every Tuesday for more honest conversations and powerful insights. Remember, Exceptional leaders share the wealth. Send this episode to someone who would benefit, leave a review to let others know about the show, and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Talk to you soon.